pleasure to introduce Randall Westgreen, who was Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Missouri. Randall and is currently a visiting fellow at the Center for Philosophy of Science here at Pitt. He's been working on various issues in economics and organization theory, particularly with a focus on cooperation. In fact, his interest in cooperation has led him to uh, interact and work with philosophers for decades in around issues in social ontology and philosophy of the social sciences. And today, Randall will be talking about the pragmatism of C.S. Peirce and R.B. Brandom as a frame for, for modeling entrepreneurship. But we have a conference that starts at nine uh, or maybe even eight. Uh, very early on at an <laughs> unacceptable time <laughs> on uh, Friday morning that lasts up to Sunday, so it's actually like a three-day uh, conference. The program is online, it brings people from uh, various places in academia, the law school, and so on and so forth. It's going to be a very large and exciting conference on law and AI. Uh, the, the, exact, the exact title is on the website. If you want to come, let me remind you, you must register, and today is a deadline for registering. So uh, if you want to come, please go online and uh, register for the conference. Um, if you're interested to meet, actually, the organizer, Dasha Press, who was a graduate student uh, in HPS until last year, she'll be arriving on Wednesday. Okay? So she will, she, she, she will be around. You can actually talk to her if you're interested in her work at the intersection of research on AI and research on the legal system. The next lunchtime talk is on Tuesday uh, next week and will be given by uh, Brian Porter, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Philosophy of Science, and it's going to be about AI and poetry. So uh, it's going to be presenting some work that we've been doing on, on, on the matter. And on Friday next week, Ken Aizawa, who was a long time ago, a graduate student in HPS until a very long time ago, uh, way before I joined. Uh, so that tells you how far it was. Uh, 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 we'll be coming actually from um, uh, New Jersey to be talking about Hotkin and Huxley's use of singular compositional abduction. So philosophy of neuroscience on uh, Friday uh, next week. And the first annual lecture series, uh, lecture of the semester will be on February 23rd and will be given by uh, Maya Goldenberg on public science communication. So you are all invited to come to these mm -hmm. lectures. Mm -hmm. Today, my uh, pleasure is to introduce our speaker, uh, Randall Westgreen, who uh, is Professor of Applied Economics, or was, I'm not quite sure, of, anyway, Professor of Applied Economics and the McQueen Chair of Entrepreneur, Entrepreneurial Leadership at the University of uh, Missouri. Uh, Randall uh, works on, in economics and organization theory, but for years now has developed an interest uh, in uh, a very serious interest, an extensive interest in philosophy, uh, and particularly in social ontology and the philosophy of the social sciences. Um, uh, among various topics he's interested in that uh, are the intersection of uh, economics and uh, philosophy is a contribution of evolutionary theory to economics and, uh, and uh, sociology, uh, the nature of formal models uh, of team organization and so on and so forth. We're very lucky to have him at the center this uh, semester. Um, I hope uh, um, your semester has been going well. And uh, today, my dad will be talking about the pragmatism of C.S. Peirce and R.B. Brandon as a frame for modeling entrepreneurship. So is yours. Thank you. And I appreciate the invitation to join you this semester uh, to practice my opsomathy. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the, the book that was the 2016 award winner for the Lakatosh Award for Philosophy of Science, mm -hmm. uh, and a little quote from it from Brian Epstein uh, of Tufts University. Compared to the social sciences, the ontology of natural science is a walk in the park. Uh, obviously a provocative statement, but since you have walked in the park, many of you in physics, uh, cognitive science, biology, uh, and I'm going to take you outside the park a bit today uh, and, and talk about the philosophy of economics as part of philosophy of social science and within the philosophy of economics, talking about entrepreneurship, which is something which has not been studied uh, for 100 years. Uh, 
uh, in philosophy. So this is the, the stack of his books that I sent to my colleagues uh, and co-authors around the country. I think that nobody else has purchased them in, in lots of 12 before. Uh, but I, I, it may be that that was casting pearls before the swine. We're going to find out soon. I want to do two things today. The first is to give you sort of a brief history of entrepreneurship thought so you can see what's going on outside the park. Uh, both as an inquiry in economics and an inquiry outside of economics because there was actually a bifurcation uh, in the history of uh, entrepreneurship thought uh, just about the middle of the 20th century. And at that time, entrepreneurship went from being the explanons to being, at least attempted to be, an explanandum. And we're going to talk about what matters in this today being sort of a process approach, uh, the understanding that I'm speaking about entrepreneurship as intended action, that it is agency in, in the sense that those of you who, who work in the theory of agency understand it to be. And it's under uncertainty, which is perhaps the most interesting component uh, of this social science. And I'm going to take you to the, the latest metaphor, which is being used uh, to, to talk about entrepreneurship, and that is treating the entrepreneur as a scientist. And this will give us uh, at least a leverage point to uh, talk about pragmatism and also social ontology. So the history of the science of entrepreneurship uh, goes back just to the 1750s. And we've been treating the entrepreneur as the embodiment of some economic function, whether that's the manager of resources, putting them together to, to achieve some end, as a risk taker, an uncertainty bearer, uh, an innovator, but whatever this was, the entrepreneur was a causal agent uh, in economics. The entrepreneur became, uh, in large part, the, uh, the reason that we had a great deal of strife between the middle of the 1800s and the middle of the 1900s as we had uh, opposing schools of thought that were fighting for primacy uh, in, in the study of economics. Uh, in fact, there's a famous Methodenstreit uh, in the German historical school and the Austrian school, uh, uh, two countries with the same language and completely opposite views about what economics is all about. The Lausanne school, uh, which is actually the basis for the modern formal theory that we teach undergraduates and PhD students now, and sort of the end of the classical school. Uh, and you'll recognize from some of the names there that the classical school actually was derived uh, from philosophical thought by philosophers holding chairs uh, of moral philosophy uh, across Europe. The point was to establish how value is created and what value is for that matter. And on top of that, the distribution of it. So if you actually trade some of this for a product, how much of it goes to the laborers who, who made the product, the, uh, the capital that went into the production of the product, and perhaps even to the entrepreneur who designed and effected it. So we'll start back at the beginning before economics was a profession. And it really didn't have, a, it really was not a profession until about 1900, 1905. Uh, before that, uh, economics was practiced by philosophers, priests, lawyers, and scoundrels. <laughs> Chief among the scoundrels was Richard Cantillon. Uh, there are uh, question marks after his birth date and his death date. Uh, perhaps the first truly wonderful conspiracy theory uh, in 1734, uh, 
his house in London was burned down. Um, and there were lots of enemies, of course, uh, that could have done this and should have done this. Uh, but also the fact that as a scoundrel, the idea of him burning down his, his house to cover his exit from the country and taking his fortune to British Guiana is, is not beyond the realm of possibility. The interesting thing about his work, oops, that didn't work, did it? Uh, was he considered for the first time the entrepreneur as an uncertainty bearer? Okay, so in the period, you would get a contract from the crown to build a bridge, to drain a field, to do something at a fixed price. Okay, you got so many crowns, you got so many AQ, whatever the, uh, the, the currency was, and it was your job to be able to do that without losing money. So you had to bear the uncertainty of completing a fixed price contract. He wrote a book which was published uh, about 20 years after his alleged death. Uh, it was actually being held by some of the early French physiocrats. Uh, they were learning from it before they got it published and actually before Louis XV actually permitted it to be published. And there's a reason for that I'll get to in a second. He identified economics as a system. And he used some of the tools that all of us use now, idealizations, isolations. He was the first, uh, we believe, to have actually talked about ceteris paribus reasoning with regard to the complex system. And he believed that entrepreneurial action actually breaks class boundaries. The way you get out of being a simple artisan and being part of the new middle class was to do something that was going to be uh, something that others would not undertake. So if you think about the etymology of the term entrepreneurship or entrepreneur, okay, it's gone back and forth across the language barrier a few times. Uh, and in Germany, you are an Unternehmer, okay, an undertaker, in English, an undertaker, and an entrepreneur, which depending on which uh, generation of French you speak is either an undertaker or a taker between. But anyhow, somebody who makes a market. I want to take some time to talk about this Austrian school because of one particular uh, point of interest. So the Austrian school on the economic side began with Karl Menger. Uh, and he was a fan of and a contemporary with uh, Franz Brentano, uh, the not class of, uh, of Menger included everything that uh, Brentano had ever written. And he was convinced that there was some kind of psychological basis behind the way people believed uh, and the way they acted in an economic sense. Now, of course, they had their sort of first generation students and collaborators, uh, Von Bon Bevec and, uh, and Meinong. Uh, and beyond that, uh, Von Wieser and Von Hellenfels. And the reason I put those two in the middle is they were neighbors for more than a dozen years when they were teachers at the professors at the German University in Prague, the Karl University. And they worked together literally for a decade on a common subject, Wert theory, the theory of value. And Adam Bell's was taken by something that Wieser told him that came from, from Menger, that we do not desire something for its value. We value something because we desire it. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they talked between the two of them about something which uh, Ederfels called natural value. Okay, so it's a subjective value of the user. Okay, and we're going to talk about this in the context of this little thing. 
Okay, why is it that you would pay eight hundred and fifty dollars for this? Okay, is it because of Karl Marx's labor theory of value? Because that's how much it took to put it together. Hell no. For two reasons. One, the the the, the amount of labor in this is really about three dollars and twenty seven cents, uh, and so it, it's a poor measure of value. But the real thing that Apple has taught us is. If you can get people to spend $800 for something that only costs $325 to make, you do really well for yourselves. <laughs> and so that's why the Apple company has just a little bit over $1.75 trillion in free cash right now. Because anybody here that's bought an iPhone or an iWatch <laughs> or anything else or, or the new uh, augmented reality goggles, when you see how much the uh, the value of those will turn out to be. In any case, uh, the interesting thing was, too, that uh, Wieser actually described a phenomenon which we still use today, where one of the so-called natural values is what we teach undergraduates as opportunity cost. Okay? So the value of something you 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 buy and use or the value of something you do is measured by what you're not doing or not putting your money into. And this, is, this has been really important, and I'll get back to this in a little bit. Adam Fels also, before he published his work on, on theory of value, did his uh, master work on Gestalt and how people view complex uh, things. And I'm going to return to that in the next slide, uh, which is a student from both Austrian schools named Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who began his career uh, uh, in the Habsburg Empire uh, and finished it at Harvard, where for all the years he was at Harvard from 1932 until his death in 1950, was the highest paid professor at Harvard. And there's some reasons for that. Uh, most of which had something to do with the fact that he asked for it. Uh, <laughs> his first book in 1911 uh, is The Theory of Economic Evolution. Okay. Now, 20 years later, it was translated into English uh, after he moved to Harvard. Uh, and it's not so much that it should be economic evolution as it should be evolutionary economics. This was the first treatise that really looked at uh, applying a, a model to how economies move, how they improve. And so his agent in this was the entrepreneur, the innovator. And to get an economy to move, you needed sort of swarms of innovation. And that's why when he was invited to, to come speak uh, on this book uh, at uh, Columbia University, he hopped on a train and came to Pittsburgh to understand the, the mix of innovations that were going on between the steel industry and the rail industry. <clears throat> that a lot of the metallurgical science a lot of the practice and the way that the two industries were organized were co-evolutionary. And so he actually spent most of his career using the railroadization, terrible word, uh, of the United States as his quintessential example of innovation swarms that led to massive economic improvement uh, in the economy something he didn't see in his home country of, uh, of Austria. The next person I want to talk about is Frank Knight. Uh, Frank Knight went away to uh, Cornell University to study philosophy and left uh, as a professor of economics. There are a number of different uh, tales about how that transformation happened, some of which involved coercion, some of which involved inviting him to leave the philosophy department. Uh, his uh, dissertation was actually published as a book called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. Uh, and it was a treatment that basically 
argued that there's a boundary between risk and uncertainty. Risk being something which is calculable, known probabilities, and uncertainty was something which we didn't have prior cases of observation to do anything with. And so what he suggested was this uncertainty bearing becomes the source of profit in the economy. Okay, because if everything's certain, then there is no profit because all prices are known, all costs are known, uh, all uh, consumption behaviors are known. So there's no way to do anything but sort of make everything come out even. And so he has a very pragmatist approach to, uh, to this that, that I'll return to in a little bit. But I did want to mention uh, a quote from him. In social science and philosophy, discussions of fact have a way of transforming themselves into arguments about what somebody really said. <laughs> now, the great irony is that we have been trying to figure out what Frank Knight said since they published his uh, doctoral dissertation in, in 1921. Uh, we've got publications in the last year uh, and getting comments back on them already because clearly I don't know what I'm talking about. Move forward about 40 years, and one of the most important economists uh, of the last century, uh, William Baumel, uh, wrote in a, in a paper in the flagship journal of, of the field that the entrepreneur is at the same time one of the most intriguing and one of the most elusive characters in the past that constitutes the subject of economic analysis. In the writings of the classical economists that we saw before, his appearance was frequent though he remained a shadowy entity without clearly defined form and function. Only Schumpeter, and to some degree Knight, succeeded in infusing him with life and assigning him a specific area of activity to any extent commensurate with the acknowledged importance of those economic roles. He then went on to say that the entrepreneur is present in institutional and applied economics, but you contrast this with formal theory where the references to entrepreneurs are scanty, if any at all. And in fact, the theoretical firm is entrepreneurless. We are performing Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. And this phrase has been used two or 300 times uh, uh, since Baumol first proposed it that literally economics has walked away from the entrepreneurial activity and its value as an explanance uh, for uh, economic progress, for profit, for social change, all of those things. So exit the economists, enter the B schools. Now this is where you're all supposed to break into a rousing uh, chorus of send in the clowns. It's okay. Everybody hates to be school. It's a natural fact. Okay. In the B schools, the study of organizations of uh, behavior is extremely pluralistic, perhaps almost tragically pluralistic. Uh, a lot of psychology, particularly the uh, social and cognitive, uh, lots of stuff being published now that those of you who are doing work in, in cog sci would understand, appreciate, and, uh, and value. Lots of sociology. In fact, the two or three branches of sociology include uh, organizational sociology as well as sort of cultural sociology in this. And there's a few heterodox economists uh, who, uh, who are still operating in the field. Uh, the problem is that in this pluralistic mess, we have people trying to chase practice by attaching theory to it, uh, often with a very long lag. And so not having that core uh, of accepted theory that came out of economics, um, we got a, a big problem. And the problem includes the fuzzy boundaries within the profession, um, I'm a member of the Academy of Management. There are 18,000 members 
and cavity management. And there are 15 or 18 different subgroups within that. And that's just one group. Okay, this doesn't include the people who do marketing or finance or accounting or decision sciences or all that other stuff. Uh, interestingly, the president of the Academy of Management this year uh, works about 400 meters from here on Roberto Clemente Drive. And uh, she's trying to hold this thing together like everybody else does by voting. There's a recent treatment of this. Uh, that I think is an interesting point of departure for us uh, at this moment. And that's called the theory-based view of entrepreneurial action. Okay, now this is a paragraph uh, written by my putative co-author uh, for this paper that I'm going to describe now. Uh, I set him the task of writing the first four paragraphs and he set me the task of writing the whole rest of the damn paper. <laughs> uh, and so, He's describing what has been going on only for the past four or five years uh, in, in the, the literature that we're arguing that these entrepreneurs hold theories about their action and the results in the economy in the same way that scientists hold theories and then test those in, in a way that we're all familiar with. Um, it, it, it's been active without a lot of detail, but there's, but we're taking this idea of the of, the, of an analogic reasoning here uh, uh, kind of seriously. And interestingly enough, we're now starting to finally get some empirical work in, in, in the form of confirmation here using uh, experimentation random controlled uh, trials. Uh, also, we're doing experimentation with individuals in, in different contexts of whether they are behaving as if they are, they are forming an hypothesis and so on. Uh, there's formal modeling, lots of it, lots of simulation modeling. Uh, and there's acres and acres and acres of, of papers being written uh, basically to, to advance the theoretic. I'm going to take one piece of this uh, that's, that I, I regard as further refinement on what has gone on over those last four or five years, a paper that recently came out in the Academy of Management Review, which is the flagship theoretical journal for the field. Uh, it's got a, an impact factor of something around 17. So that's what, 5X times the Journal of Philosophy, something like that. Anyhow, so they actually get up there in front of God and everybody and say, entrepreneurs are scientists, a pragmatist approach to producing value out of uncertainty. So you've seen all those words before. Uh, and some of them even go back into, into classical thinking. Okay. They argue that the cognitive processes of the entrepreneur are guided and validated by their value in action. Okay, that looks pretty damn close to a Persian uh, uh, maxim. Uh, and they do a fair job of ex expanding on this. The most interesting thing is they introduce abduction. And it's the Persian abduction, the conjecture, the, the, the hypothesizing, not the uh, uh, um, explanation. Uh, not the inference to best explanation. This is actually the Persian view. And so I actually wrote them and said, how the hell did you come up with this? <laughs> and the answer was, Oops. nope, they found it in the SEP. Okay? Because <laughs> that's where everybody finds everything, right? You, know, you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and, and you either look up Purse or you look up uh, pragmatism, and right there you see abduction as the first step in what is otherwise an inductive reasoning process by Peirce. And they use a term that comes from the, the management literature, which is product market fit. So think of this as the pragmatic outcome, that you are making a bet 
that when you sit down and start designing this and producing this and putting half a billion dollars uh, at risk, that this will actually be accepted by in sufficient quantities in the market to warrant the effort. But I want to go a little farther uh, with first than, than, than they did. So here's a quote uh, that comes from one of the 1878 first writings. Proposals for hypotheses inundate us in an overwhelming flood. <laughs> you feel this flood, you not? There's more hypotheses than you can deal with, right? While the process of verification to which each one must be subjected before it can count as an all at all as an item, even the most likely knowledge is so very costly in time, energy, and money, and consequently in ideas which might have been had for that time, energy, and money, which is opportunity cost. So even though uh, von, or, uh, von Wieser uh, defined opportunity cost in 1914, uh, Peirce beat him there by 35 years, which is what he seems to have done with a lot of things. That economy would override every consideration, even if there were any other serious considerations. In fact, there are no other serious considerations beyond economy of research. Okay, so in, in 1976, uh, this was written. Yet no other part of this great man's philosophizing has fallen on stonier ground than the economy of research. The purse bibliographies now run to over 800 entries currently and add some 40 items per annum. Yet all this writing, extending over the century since purse flourished, contains not one single significant item devoted to the analysis of this aspect of his theory of science. And that was penned, of course, by Nicholas Rescher. Uh, and if you if you if you really feel like, like you want to see something fun, something really interesting someday, his paper from 1976, A Person in Economy Research, is a delight. And I'm going to, going to make a, a pitch here by, by taking a, a sentence, a very long sentence, out of his conclusion paragraph. Even in a very rudimentary form, the economic perspective emphasized by Peirce can straightforwardly resolve some of the key disputed issues in the recent theory of inductive reasoning, including problems regarding Carnap's requirement of total evidence, Hempel's paradox of the raisins, Goodman's Grew paradox, the concept of simplicity preference, and some of the key issues co controverted between Popper and his opponents. And in this little paper, he goes through each of those things and applies Peirce's economy of research as a way to sort uh, through the inductive mess. Now, let me add a little bit more from Peirce in sort of an, a roundabout way. Um, so I, I told you that, that Frank Knight had pragmatist leanings. And contrary to the perm to the to the present way of dealing with decision making uncertainty, uh, where they treat uncertainty as an epistemic state of nature, even to the point where they talk about there's knowns and there's unknowns and there's unknown unknowns. Okay, imagine an epistemology which permits unknown unknowns. And then tell me how you're supposed to act in the face of unknown unknowns. What would you do if you were facing an unknown unknown? How would you change your behavior? Yeah. On a rat. Yes. <laughs> you can't change anything, right? Okay. You investigate to make the unknown unknowns known. Except if you don't know the unknowns, how do you investigate them? Exploratorily. You investigate exploratorily. And we'll get to that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in two recent papers I did with one of the previous visiting fellows uh, here, uh, Travis Holmes. Uh, we investigated this uh, and, and, and actually tied uh, the, the original uh, Pershing approach uh, to 
partial beliefs to Ramsey's more famous partial beliefs uh, to what, what, what Knight projected. So one of the famous examples uh, that I brought up with Ed Lau the other day is uh, Ramsey coming to a fork in the road. As a, as a rambler, he was out and about all the time. And he says, what do I do when I come to a crossroads and I'm uncertain whether to go to the left or the right? Now, there's a, a, a farmer standing in a field 500 meters away. And whether I turn aside to ask him will depend on the relative inconvenience of going out of my way to cross the fields or of continuing on the wrong road, if it is the wrong road, but it will also depend upon how confident I am that I am right. And clearly the more confident I am of this, should be willing to go from the road to check against my opinion. I propose therefore to use the distance I would be prepared to go to ask as a measure of the confidence of my opinion. And what I've said above explains how this is to be done. So this is very much the same as the question of purses, time, energy, and money to expend, in this case, particularly time and energy, uh, to either update your beliefs or not. So we actually find a couple of items from Knight that, that sort of Adam break uh, uh, Ramsey. So six years before uh, the papers that are collected as his truth and probability uh, papers, uh, it's clear that we may speak in some sense of the true value of judgment and of the capacity to act, but it's the person's own opinion of these values which controls his activities. Hence, the variables are, from the standpoint of the person concerned, again, the pragmatist approach, reduced to two, their subjective or felt uncertainty and their cognitive feeling towards it. Now, this is something you see a lot in, in decision theory, theory now, where we're balancing our probabilistic assessments against our cognitive attitudes towards the decision. The businessman himself is not, mere, not really forms the best estimate he can, and he's using estimate in, in the, the sense of a conjecture uh, of the outcome of his actions, but he's likely to estimate the probability that his estimate is correct. This degree of certainty or confidence felt in the conclusion after it is reached cannot be ignored for it is of the greatest practical significance where you might switch out practical for pragmatic. Uh, the action which follows upon an opinion depends upon as much upon the amount of confidence in that opinion as it does upon the favorableness of the opinion itself. So now we are really in the, uh, the state here where we have to look at the mental processes of the individual decision maker rather than you know, the epistemic states uh, that are, that are outside that decision makers control. So I've actually tried to, to dress this up a little bit by um, taking a recent book by the two epistemologists, um, Frank, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Matt McGrath and uh, Jeremy Fantle. Uh, this little book on knowledge in an uncertain world is, is a, a real, blessing for somebody who is coming from social sciences and looking for a way to organize this idea of uh, graded beliefs and, its, and their relationships uh, to knowledge. Now I want to go from, um, from this to looking at uh, social ontology. And for those of you who, who do, do not read in this area, there's two big flavors of social ontology. One is that the, at the social or societal level, where we often talk about the, uh, the, the social acceptance of gender, of race, of other constructs like that. And then at the small group level, which is tied more closely to action theory. Uh, and there's two versions of that that I'm going to talk about explicitly. 
One is Lionel Kumala's uh, version where we intentionality of the group is primitive. That is, the group can hold we intention uh, mental states. There's also a group led by Michael Brotman and Kirk Ludwig who look at this as um, a distributed form or an individualistic form of we intentionality. I'll get to that in a second. So Ramo, uh, for a long time, was the, uh, the major proponent of we intentionality. Uh, he was very much influenced by Wilfred Sellers uh, uh, about what we intentionality is. And in the writings, particularly going up to his uh, 2013 book on social ontology, he argues that we can hold as a group uh, we intentions as well as the other group held uh, mental states of intentionality. If we operate with um, group reason, if there is a collectivity condition, which is effectively, uh, are we going to act qua members of a group and collective commitment that basically says that we will not defect uh, from the group until the group uh, goal is met. Now, those conditions do a lot of explanatory lifting here, uh, even as much as, as his other treatments of what's behind uh, we intentionality. And um, the implication for these group held intentions and beliefs uh, is really important and I wanted, I put the asterisk here so I would remember that uh, one of the things he does in this book is actually talk about external authority to the group. And that external authority may actually be the source of the intention, the, ins the source of the goals, and may in fact be the, the, the source of the collectivity intention. So his argument is uh, that if we are inside an organization and the boss tells us to do something as a group, then yeah, that's re real we intentionality, but it's not something that we, uh, we devise ourselves as some kind of a group process. So building a group level account where we admit that we intentionally exist, intentionality exists in the group, and then spreading it out over, over some time period between the initiation of the, the group and its final conclusion, okay, uh, is, is, is the way we're gonna approach this. And group formation is not strictly a constitutive act. It's not, you know, we're gonna do this together or we three are gonna do it together. It includes not just the, the, the constituent, uh, uh, side of the group, but also the shared intentionality, the shared identity that we have, we identify ourselves as a group, we act as a member of the group. And so we're gonna have beliefs, we're gonna have the cognitive attitudes, and that's going to lead us to some measure of the group's credence about the success of this venture which is being proposed. Uh, and this will of course vary over time, uh, and what we want to get to is a point where the group's credence exceeds their threshold for action. And uh, this is all going to be held together by something kind of magical. Uh, but, but hold on to this for a moment. Now, there are three team events. Okay, these would be the visible things. These would be the, the, the things that are, are actions by the group, not by individuals within. So instantiation of the adventure, of the venture, sorry, not that adventure, whether we experiment further, okay, at some point, and abandonment, you know, this isn't gonna work. So the instantiation decision, basically we do at the point where the, the group formation is completed and we now instantiate the venture uh, because our group credence 
exceeds our group threshold uh, for credence. And this is a literally, again, you have to accept the, the existence of group credences and, and group thresholds uh, to get to here. Now, before we get to there, we may have times, time slices, uh, where we are going to ask uh, the group and the group will decide to do more experimentation. And that's going to use um, the, uh, the economics of research from Hearst and Rescher. Okay, so only if the value of the additional research exceeds the expected cost of the, of the additional research will we act and only because our credence as a group is below our threshold for action. Um, when we get to the point where our threshold is higher than our credence and we don't believe that there is any, uh, any experimentation that will lead to, to more value or to, to, to higher credences, we abandon the project. Okay, and behind this then, we've got a set of beliefs that are holding this together and link the knowledge that we get from the experimentation um, uh, to uh, our, our collective beliefs. And so basically we've got this thing that says knowledge will be increased after the experiment, but that may not increase our attitudes, our kind of attitudes towards the project, and it may not actually uh, cause our credence to increase because we are more certain, have a higher credence for this, okay? And so, again, this is, this is as close as we get to any kind of uh, interaction among the group members uh, to, to move us forward. And so we don't really have an account of the, the mechanisms for belief updating for basically uh, Saul on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for the bright light to come and convince us that e either we, we experiment more, update our beliefs, or go home. Now let's get down to the individual level, uh, and we're going to follow two Donald Davidson students, uh, Michael Brotman uh, on this side, and Kirk Ludwig, uh, both of whom who uh, have, have built their idea of how we intentions are held as I intend that we do J. Now, Brockman's account requires, of course, then, that you hold the same intentions inside the group. You hold the same intentions inside the group. We have mutual understanding of each other's uh, commitment to that. And we, we do this by having individual sub plans that mesh together. And so it has to be a very intense uh, understanding uh, and of, of what everybody else is doing, to the point where I have to change what I plan to do in response to what the other group members intend to do. And so there's about eight sufficient conditions that it takes to, to get to this. Uh, but it's really good for the management people because the subtitle uh, of his book is A Planning Theory of Acting Together. Everybody gets excited about this in B-School because it sounds like strategic planning. Correct. Okay. Ludwig, on the other hand, uh, in what I think is a really, really good book, actually lays out his approach as, as a way of saying, we can believe and we can understand individual intention and individual beliefs. Okay, that's, that, that, that's something we all can do, I think. But that doesn't give us license to understand what a group does. There's no common mind above the group. So he lays this out in a series of sort of uh, Davidson action sentences where he talks about what is conditioned on the individual beliefs uh, in terms of intention uh, to do joint action. 
Lovely book. Recommend it. Okay. So this individuation buys us a few things. One, it first gets us two new actions. Okay. Defection. Okay. And Warren can say, oh, this is going nowhere. I didn't sign up for this. And so that is another kind of event uh, in a Davidsonian or Anscombe uh, approach to action that exists. It also allows us to understand the establishment of prior intention rather than just intention and action. So the group action literally had to be identified as intention and action. They did it. Either they abandoned or they, they started the business or they decided to do more experimentation. And it also makes peace with a, a noisy group in the management field who are micro-foundationalists. So they are methodological individualists, particularly with respect to explanatory individualism. Not so much ontological individualists, but explanatory individualists. And they're noisy, and they, uh, they need to be pacified. So I'm pacified. But what does it require of us to do? Well, we've got to think of what, what the aggregation rules are. Uh, there have to be explicit interpersonal comparisons among the members of the group. And it's going to require a lot more time slices because we're going to have individual actions as events, individual updating of mental states as events. And so... The, the, it, it's not a, a simple thing of everybody has finally decided that we're all on the same page. And so all of the beliefs, all of the, uh, the attitudes, the cognitive attitudes, all of the credences and all of the credence uh, thresholds have to be disaggregated to the individual level. So each of us as a member of the group can hold a different credence threshold. Okay. And in fact, one of the things that we, we find in the literature is the existence of hubris, okay, where the knowledge doesn't support doing the action, but we decide to do it because whether you call it a cognitive attitude or just plain stupidity, we go ahead and do the thing. And then we also have uh, prior intentions, which will be arrayed throughout this time path to the point where the last member of the team agrees that it's time to act. And so we have to identify when the individual members of the group uh, have, have established their prior intention to act. And then, um, so I'm missing one stuff here. There we go. So there's a causal chain for the, for the thing where we decide to eventually do this. And it, it involves both an updating of the beliefs or an updating of the, the attitudes by an individual member to then commit to acting uh, as a member of the group. Okay, the same thing holds for abandonment. OK, because it's not going to happen that everybody in the team will, will come together and look at each other and say, yeah, this is stupid and, and, and leave. It's going to happen over different time slices and it may require a specific decision rule for each member. So the one that's up here suggests that uh, member J of the group decides that if we do two more experiments and we don't get anything out of it, I'm getting out of here, I'm taking my marbles and going home. Uh, but uh, either does that by defection or I'm going to stick it out. And when everybody finally des decides this, we'll break up the marbles that we all have together uh, instead of me just this exit. This is actually a pretty serious thing. Uh, any Airbnb fans in here? Yeah, OK. So Airbnb was started by three roommates in San Francisco uh, for the uh, convention, uh, the Democrat convention. 
and they started renting out the back room, letting people sleep on air mattresses. Uh, and it, it grew from there. And when somebody heard about it and said, you know, you could, you could actually make a business out of this. Why don't you come to my incubator for new ideas? And I'll train you how to put this together and, and instantiate the business. And I'll only ask for 6% of the shares of your stock. Okay. So uh, that was Y Combinator, which is a famous uh, incubator out there in the world. And then Ashton Kutcher. The idea that he's got so much money, he can give it away just stupefies me. But anyhow, he offered another $250,000 because this looked like a good idea. And he wanted to take three or 4% of the business. And by the time they actually took it public, and it's now worth somewhere between 50 and $80 billion. Okay, 6% of that is actually quite a bit. Okay, and it's 6% that the owners, those original founders don't have. So the original founders basically have about 30% of the business in a financial sense but they've given up their authority to make decisions in the business. So they've traded for money, their control over the business. So this idea of defection and, and doing this sort of stuff is kind of a big deal. And I'm gonna skip on here. And so basically we have an, an elaborated model which has two modes of description, group and individual levels. Social ontology as a foundation for group agency. The, the uncertainty is, is, is pitched in a pragmatic sense. We have stopping rules that come from Kurse's economy of research. We, we have a, a, a mode of action which is analogous to Kursian uh, pragmatism in research. And we have explicit timing in all of this. Now, I promised that I would, would, would talk about uh, Brandom's discursive uh, pragmatics here, but I'm just going to save that for a second paper. Uh, and so the, a call for papers just came out with the title of Framing Novelty, a Linguistic Approach to the Understanding of Entrepreneurship, Creativity, and Innovation. Okay. Now, in my field, this is the way papers are written now. Call for papers comes out and you send in a half-assed version. Uh, and if it's not too half-assed, they invite you to come to a developmental uh, uh, conference. The developmental co conference for this is in Crete this summer. And so uh, I, I find that to be uh, an interesting way to do this. Oh, gosh, exactly. Uh, I, the paper I sent in last week, uh, the, the conference for development is going to be at Oxford uh, in, in June. And so this is a, a thing, and, and the, the journals are doing this. These are the two top journals in the field are basically saying, you know, stop sending that crap into us over the transom. You know, let us see you in advance. Let us tell you what is going to work. And oh, by the way, if we get you all in a room, we can start recruiting you as reviewers. Okay, speaking of pragmatism. Uh, and so I'm gonna, gonna suggest that rather than, than, than carry on with the, uh, with the linguistic approach to the, what's going on inside the group, which is how we actually update our beliefs, I want you to go and find the, uh, the 2010 introduction of the iPad, okay? And you'll actually see all of the elements that are explained in great detail in here. And in fact, trying to put this on slides is, is just beyond my, my ability. But if you get out your Deontic scorecard, okay? you will see all of the pieces of the linguistic approach, the assertion, the reasons, the justification, and the entitlement 
to holding that assertion. And if there's anybody who, is, who has figured out how to assert entitlement, it's Steve Jobs standing up there and saying, hey, before I get into this new thing, let me talk about uh, the iPods. We sold our 27 million, 27 million iPod last week. Okay. And we've had 3 billion downloads from the iTunes store, the app store. And he goes through and gives you the reasons why this is something you absolutely have to have. And of course, <laughs> 500 million iPads sold later in 10 years, okay? It's clear that this idea of, of the discourse matters. And that's what this linguistic approach thing that we're going to talk about in the next paper is. So if you believe that my use of this is like using the Eiffel Tower for a paperweight. Uh, it may be in a philosophical sense that. But the payoff in, in the, the, the economic science sense is many, 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 many decimal points. And so I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much for letting me speak. Can we take a few minutes break and then we have time for questions?